But before that, welcome everyone to the Butter Mixer. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate, as always, we appreciate your time and the support you give us whenever we run these activities. And for us, this is essentially meant to be a learning session. So to help everyone improve how they facilitate, how they think about collaboration and innovation within their teams. And joining us today to do exactly just that is Patrick. So Patrick is a senior director or uh, with the Luma Institute, and he's here uh, to essentially talk about how to encourage better innovation within your teams. Because as we know, it's such a challenging thing to do um, and to even master. And just the idea of fostering that culture of innovation is maybe going to be helpful to each and every one of us here to um, kickstart that in each of our individual organizations. Um, I, I can't tell you enough how much of an expert Patrick is when it comes to collaboration, facilitation, and all things design thinking. And um, through um, this this workshop today, we hope to also that he can share his knowledge to all of us about that. And yeah, take it away, Patrick. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Jessica. It's nice to be here uh, and, and to meet all of you. I've heard a lot about the, the, the better community and it's really mm -hmm. nice to, to finally be in front of some of you. Uh, again, my name is Patrick Sharbaugh. I, uh, I work at Luma Institute, where I'm a senior program director, which is a fancy way of saying I, I manage relationships with uh, many of our enterprise clients. Um, uh, clients, uh, we, we work with clients all over the world, and I'll tell you a little bit about what Luma does right now. Um, but um, the clients I manage include clients like Microsoft, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, HP, Slack, um, Cisco, and, and quite a few others. Uh, and, and these are organizations who themselves would like to become more innovative. And the way that they've decided to do that is to, to leverage human-centered design uh, in the service of, of creating a bottom-up culture of innovation. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about, about how that works. Um, but a, for, for the moment, um, this is our, our, um, our agenda. I think you can also find this um, uh, elsewhere in Butter. We're going to be spending a few minutes in a nice breaker and saying hello, um, and um, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the the, the Luma Institute and, and and how we approach this idea of HCD um, in the service of innovation, um, and we will uh, we will get uh, hands on with one of one of our Luma methods um, and spend about twenty or twenty five minutes on that. Do a quick share out. Uh, I'll introduce you to a digital tool that Luma. Um, makes available um, called Luma Workplace, and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A at the end. Um, and of course, if you do have any questions at any point during the middle, maybe just pop those into the into the chat so we don't forget it, you don't forget it, um, and, and I'm sure Cheska will be able to, to capture that so that we have those, uh, those questions uh, available on handy at the end. Right now, I thought we would we would all quickly do a an icebreaker. I'm sure you're all pretty much familiar with icebreakers and how they work. Um, this is one I sort of cooked up myself last night. I was thinking about the ways that people are, um, that there's these binary ways that um, people are really a spectrum, but that spectrum um, exists on sort of a binary uh, range of ways that we approach problems and, 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 and life really in general. And I was just really interested to find out where people might place themselves on these on these spectrums of uh, of ways of thinking. Um, so what I'm going to ask you to do is, as I walk through each one of these, um, for each each of you to grab one of the stars and place it where you think you personally land on here. For example, the first one is is um, you know a, a right brain or or left brain person. Um, are you more of a uh, of a left brain person, more rational, more more analytical, more of a word person, or are you more right brain person, right? More creative, more imaginative, um, more more inst uh, instinctive, going with your gut, more of a picture person. Um, I'd probably place myself. It's really hard because um, I've got a science degree, but also um, I, I tend to work over here a little bit. I, it's tough. So. On this first one, if you can, does everybody have access? Can you grab those stars? Place uh, place a star where you think you where you land on the on the left brain, right brain continuum.
and that's okay. Once once you've done the left brain, right brain, where, where do you land in terms of divergent and convergent, right? If, if we think of convergent thinking as, as making choices and divergent thinking as as uh, enjoying the creative creating choices, where do you tend to, to land on that? Um, I myself, I love the problem space. I could, I could, I could sit over there trying to um, uh, to, to be more, um, uh, be more problem solving. Um, are, do, do, you, do you like uh, getting into that problem space on a double diamond, or do you prefer spending time and, and really relaxing in to understand what problem that we're solving over on the left side? Uh, I know that I'm much more of a problem framer myself. I could spend almost forever in that, sometimes to my detriment. Um, and the next one is is uh, between introverted and extroverted. Which where do we think we land on that? Um, uh, not everybody who is uh, is a facilitator is necessarily a very extroverted person, and uh, it, sometimes introversion can be a, a, a great asset. Um, much more thoughtful can be sometimes. Where do we land on that? I love my my alone time, my me time, but I also, you know, I hunger for groups and crowds like this one. I'd put it over there. And finally, are you more of a work person or more of a picture person? Maybe you can think about this in terms of the way that you learn, right? We all learn differently. We think about visual learners and, and, and learners who have to read the book and highlight the, the book. Where do, where do most of us land on that? more over here on the, the picture person side. Good, I think I think that's got just about everybody. So so this is interesting. I love the idea of dot voting because as many of you may know, um, you know what we what we end up with dot voting is sort of a heat map, right? We can very quickly look and see where the energy is in, in, in a room. Um, and, and, and get a visual sense, you know, especially for us, for us visual thinkers out there, um, we can very quickly um, have, have a look and see what, uh, um, you know, where the energy, where the heat is uh, around this. Looks like um, we've got a, a mix of between left brain and right brain, a lot of divergent thinkers over here, not as many convergent thinkers. Uh, I'd say that's a little unusual, probably. Most of us are much better at finding patterns and, and, and analyzing data than we are at creating that data. Most people are in general. But I'm, I'm maybe not surprised to find that with this group. Um, good mix, um, sort of an even mix between problem framers and problem solvers. <laughs> By and large, a more introverted group over here um, for the most part. Um, and, uh, and again, also much more uh, visual thinkers and, and picture people um, than word people. I do love to sit down with a good book, um, but you know, it's. It, I, I also love to love to sketch and draw, and uh, that's how I think. So good, thanks everybody. Um, I think that was a that was an interesting way to start things. I want right now, very quickly, to show you a, a, a short video uh, about what Luma Luma does. Um, Cheska, I think you have access to that from your end. You want to play that? I'll stop sharing. This is about two and a half or three minutes, I think. Did you know that you know anyone, that anyone can, be can be innovative? It's not only it's a few geniuses, geniuses wearing, lab wearing lab coats or black, black turtlenecks. In real life, all of us can come up with creative solutions to tough problems. But how do you do that? How can someone just be more innovative? And how can people on a team or across an organization be more innovative together? At Luma, we recognized a global need for an easy to learn, practical, and scalable way for everyone to do just that. So we got to work with rigorous research, testing, and assessment. And from all that, we cre created the Luma system of innovation. And it transforms the way people work by giving them a powerful tool set and shared language for innovation, even across countries and cultures. The Luma system is based on human-centered design, also known as design thinking, which has a simple goal, to make things better for people, whether the thing is a product, a process, a service, or anything else. 
We looked at more than a thousand design thinking techniques, and we chose the most effective, flexible, and easy to use methods to form a unique, powerful, and versatile tool set. These methods are organized into three key design skills, looking, understanding, and making. The system is flexible and versatile, so you can use it for any type of problem in any type of setting. For some challenges, you can use a single method or you can combine multiple methods for more complex situations. The methods are powerful tools and you can pick and choose the ones that work best for your unique problems. Plus, the Luma system seamlessly integrates with other processes like Agile or Lean Six Sigma or whatever you use to actually supercharge their impact. As people apply the Luma methods, they naturally begin demonstrating key innovation behavior. And as people work this way together, day to day, they begin to create wholesale culture change that empowers entire organizations to innovate all on their own. We've seen it happen time after time all around the world. It can happen for you too. Nothing else empowers like Luma. Awesome. Okay, Patrick, uh, I'll just unmute you for a bit. Uh, I think you did there. Perfect. Now Fantastic. we can hear you. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'd love to, to, to just touch um, on, on a few of the points that were made in that, um, in that presentation, in, in that quick video, and tell you a little bit uh, about where Luma is coming from and, and how we do what we do and why we do what we do. Um, you know, first of all, we all know that innovation is is important right now. Never, probably, never been more important um, at any point. It's um, you know the it's always been important, but the the pace and the the degree to which things are changing in the world have have really never been greater. Um, Eighty percent of CEOs are, are concerned their existing offerings won't be relevant in just a few years, uh, and 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 many of them also rank innovation as the top three strategic priority for them. Right, but yet very few of them feel that their organizations have mastered those elements that they're going to need uh, to be able to pivot and and to be as as uh, as innovative as they need to be to, to match the conditions over the next decade. And this is a little bit strange because innovation is something that we've been doing since really the dawn of civilization. Um, you know, the idea of, of, of making things better and, and finding a way to ad adapt to uh, to, to new circumstances. Um, you know, we like the idea that innovation really means uh, to renew the Latin root, comes from the, the 15th century, uh, to make new again or renew. Um, and one of the things that is that we're discovering right now is that uh, the way that we used to work, organizations, people, teams, everywhere, um, that's changing dramatically, right? Uh, the idea of innovation literacy, that is the idea previously, you know, before, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, the, the only people who needed to know how to be innovative or, you know, were people in the, in the boardroom up in the corner office. Today, that's no longer good enough. We all need to be able to do this and we need, need to be able to do it well. And organizations are finding that, you know, the, the, that small um, group of people who traditionally were the ones who came up with the new ideas isn't enough to do it quickly enough and, and, and to the degree uh, that, that's necessary now. So everybody needs to have that literacy in how to innovate, but very few of us are trained in doing that, right? The idea of coming up with new ideas and, and, and framing problems and solving problems is, is something that very few of us are trained, unless you've been to one of these new um, you know, master's degrees in, in design thinking, it doesn't come naturally to, to the way that most of us are formally schooled. So the way that Luma um, approaches this is we feel that human-centered design is, is a great way to help teams and organizations um, embrace the idea of innovation and come to it in a, in a repeatable, structured framework for it. Um, th th there's lots, of course, of, of definitions of human-centered design out there. One of the ones that we like a lot is very simple. It's the discipline of developing solutions in the service of people. And there's really three parts to that. The first one is that it's a discipline. Um, and, and by that, we mean that it's not a one-shot 
thing, right? It's something that, like any skill, we need to, to constantly do it, right? It's a way of thinking, a way of communicating and doing every day. Um, it's not, uh, innovation is not an event. It's not a eureka moment. It's something that we can become skilled at uh, in the same way that we can become skilled at anything. And that's a really important point for us. The, the, another point in here is that it's about developing solutions. And we, by that, we don't mean that we're, that we're jumping straight to solutions because we don't want to do that. But it means that we're thinking about making things better. We really like um, uh, the definition of design from uh, Herb Simon, a Nobel laureate um, in, in economics, also um, industrial designer and, and what many would consider the father of artificial intelligence. He said that everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. So that's a sort of a, 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 a longish way of saying you're a designer if you are making things better. If you're trying to make things better, you are designing a, a preferred or better outcome. And we're all doing that every day. We, all of us spend almost every day trying to make things better in that sense we are all designers. We don't mean designers with a capital D. There's a place for people who went to design school, of course. But in the sense of trying to make things better, we're, we're all designers. And in that sense, we, we very much believe that human-centered design um, can, can apply and, and be of service to everybody. And finally, of course, you know, human-centered design, it's called human-centered design because it places people at the center. Every problem is a people problem. Every problem is a people problem. There are no non-people problems. If somebody tr says to me, we've got a problem, but there are no people involved in it, I would suggest to them, you probably don't have a problem, right? Um, everything that we do, uh, the problems that we are solving is in the service of people. And, and this is true of, of businesses uh, and, and the way that businesses um, ideally work as well. Steve Jobs knew this very well. You've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. Uh, Jeff Bezos certainly knows it. You know, be customer obsessed, starting with the customer and work backwards. That's what we all um, should ought to, to be doing for every problem that we have. And every time we're trying to make things better, every time we're, we're innovating. So that's really where <clears throat> uh, we come from. I'm going to switch back over to, um, to my mural right now. And, uh, and I'm going to share my entire screen because that's going to be easiest. And, and say a little bit more about the Luma system. So one of the things that you saw in that video is that um, the, 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 what we call the Luma system is a, is a taxonomy of 36 human-centered design methods, right? Now, we all know there are a lot more than 36 human-centered design methods out there. Um, and the way that, that Luma came up with this, this set of methods, <clears throat> you saw a little bit about in the, uh, in the, uh, in the video, but uh, our system is really, it's a core system. It's there so that organizations, um, organizations don't need a thousand design thinking methods. We did discover that there were uh, more than a thousand design thinking methods um, that, are, that are widely in use uh, out there in, uh, among various industries. And when Luma began, you know, do, you know started about 11 years ago, we did a, a total survey of all of those methods. And the way that we did that survey was, as many of you might be familiar with, we, we sort of applied a filter to that. How universally applicable is it? How easy is it to teach and apply? Do we need special tools or instruments? Um, how um, how human-centered is it, right? Does it place you know people uh, at the center rather than technology or rather than business processes? Um, and, and how effective is it at driving results? And we did basically a giant affinity cluster of all those all those uh, methods. And what we ended up with was uh, an organic, um, we, we found these emergent nine different sort of categories um, around, uh, around the, uh, all of those methods. And so that's how we ended up with that, 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 um, that system, right? Some of those are around looking, understanding human behavior, ethnographic research, uh, participatory research, one of which we're going to we're going to do today. Um, even evaluative research, things like critique and uh, and a heuristic review. 
Um, some of these methods are, are around understanding the problem, really making sure that we're understanding the people, the patterns, how people prioritize things, and uh, making sure that we can frame up the problem before we jump off into solutions. Um, and of course, some of those are around uh, imagining you know, future possibilities and, and, and making, giving tangible form to those things, whether that's with um, ideations and the many alternatives to brainstorming that are out there, or uh, you know, making prototypes and 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 uh, building in order to learn. And sometimes um, that means making a making an argument for our idea with design rationale. So, um, one thing that's important to know is that this is not a process. There are lots of great uh, innovation and and design centered processes out there. Whether that comes from Stanford or whether it's the the UK Double Diamond um, from from the UK Design Council. Uh, or, or the you know Google Ventures Design Sprint. Many organizations have their own uh, process for for innovation, and all of those are perfectly fine. Um, most of them are, are very very similar to each other. What we found is that organizations don't want another process. What they want is a way to 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 be able to execute on their existing processes a little bit better and more easily. So that's why we say that Luma System is not a process. It's more like a taxonomy. Um, or, or or a bat belt, right? Batman, depending on what circumstance he's in, is going to reach for this tool or that tool in the same way we would do that with the Luma method. So those the, those 36 methods can map quite easily to, uh, for example, the design think the the Stanford D School design thinking process, uh, or the IDEO process, or Google Ventures Design Sprint. Um, uh, without becoming a process, right? It certainly doesn't mean that we need only to use looking methods first, and then we use understanding and then making methods. Uh, that's not at all how, how it would work. We can pull those um, in the same way that Batman would pull from uh, from his tool belt. So the, the Luma system is, is really um, useful. You know, if we can always use just one method, you know, um, at any point, but it comes becomes really um, into its own when we begin combining these methods into, into to sets of methods or combinations of methods or what we sometimes use the metaphor of recipes to talk about how those methods can come together. Um, because the, the, the recipes, whether those that we already have created ourselves or, or those that could be created from scratch are made up of, of design methods and they can be customized to meet the needs of whatever it is the the, the, the session, for example, that we're going to be running, if we've got a uh, 90 minutes with people, well, we need to know exactly what what outcome we need to have, have achieved at the end of the 90 minutes. So from that, knowing what that outcome is, we can go back and choose the correct methods in the right order that are going to get us to the particular outcome that we're trying to, to get to. Um, the, the metaphor right there, again, is sort of like, um, it's sort of like a uh, that of a uh, you know cooking ingredients, we can think of the the Luma system like the common food types in our in our kitchen and pantry, right? Those those ingredients can be combined in all kinds of different ways, but it's also we also know that not every ingredient can go with every other ingredient. In the same way, not every Luma method is a perfect match for every other method. Um, there are there are some methods that go much better together uh, in the same way. But in the same way that, that, that food types and ingredients can be combined according to a recipe to make a meal, Luma methods can be, can be used to, to do the same thing. Um, and and I'll, I'll be able to show you a little bit more what that looks like uh, and, and how we combine those methods when we look at Luma Workplace in, uh, in just a little while. Um, so, you know, one further point is that design thinking I think as as we all know, human centered design, design thinking, it's um it's been around and, and it's become quite popular. And there's lots of organizations right now. In fact, 90% of Fortune 100 companies have invested in some form of design thinking, training, and cultural integration to to create better business outcomes. And my question, I think it's worth wondering, is why then are do not 90% of Fortune 100 companies are they not design led companies? Um, and, and that's because it's not as easy as just dropping in some some training um, and uh, and expecting that everyone is suddenly going to you know you're going to become a um, 
a human-centered design-driven organization. Um, culture change is much more difficult than that, and and and, and all, not all training is created equal, of course. And so, you know, one of the final things I want to to to, to speak to is that the the training and, and all of the design thinking training that's going on out there can be useful. But really, what we like to do is we bring it back to something that was mentioned in the video, and that's these, these six behaviors of innovative teams. And I think this is really important, is that there are, there are really six ways of working that are, that are common to, to, to all the most creative and, and innovative teams and organizations out there. And that is working visually, right? using drawing to aid thinking, building in order to learn, right? Being able to make, make our thinking tangible, whether that's with sketching or building something, being questioning, making sure that we, we understand the problem fully from a human perspective before we start solving for the problem. That's incredibly rare. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but in my experience, that's incredibly rare. People want to go straight to solutions and, and pausing and taking time to really question the question is uh is not as common as it should be the idea of being imaginative sounds you know sounds intuitive but by imagination what we mean is a that that our ideas are driven from human insights about our stakeholders and b that we're not just coming up with one good idea but dozens or scores or hundreds of great ideas that's key right um being collaborative right everyone loves to talk about being collaborative but you know few teams truly are collaborative being collaborative means you're not just talking with other people regularly, but you are working together with them to build something together, to build something together. That's collaboration. Um, and not just within your little business unit, but of course, across um, across the organization in an interdisciplinary, uh, cross, uh, you know, cross-functional way. The, the empathy of of this is it can't be you know overstated how important that is as a as an innovative behavior driven by curiosity curious curiosity about about people uh you know certainly um walks frequently in the stakeholders shoes and places user needs above all other considerations that's incredibly important for innovation and finally working in an iterative way right making sure that we're always taking small bets and iterating our way to success rather than um trying to get it done in in one big shot which is very risky. These six behaviors are really at the root of what innovation is and, and, and certainly at the root of what design thinking is. So when we think about working in this way, um, all of our methods are intended to, to, to pull these behaviors out of people. There's nothing magic about these 36 methods. The, really, the, the, the best thing about them is that by using them, People cannot help but work in these ways, um, and and that's what you know. What one of the things that we think is so so important and compelling about about these thirty six methods is that they pull out and and draw out this kind of behavior in people, and that's really how the you're going to get an organization to 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 change is when their behavior changes, not what not just when they're uh, they're they're using certain methods and activities. So the final thing I'll show you here about Luma is the way that we do that. Um, uh, our, our training programs are intended to operate at scale. Um, and, uh, and, and we have different sorts of um, key roles that we are developing in an organization, whether that's um, you know, practitioners who are Luma certified practitioners. They've gone through uh, one of our 90 day training programs. Um, or facilitators, right? People who are certified practitioners who can go on to understand how not just to use these methods themselves, but to facilitate that for other teams and help other teams um, get to their outcomes by, by using this. Um, and even to the point where we're, we have trained the trainer programs where we wanna create um, uh, you know, autonomy and self-sufficiency in our client organizations so that they don't have to depend on us for doing all this training. They could eventually turn, turn out their own internally certified instructors and begin teaching it on their own, um, at which point they can scale all of this much more quickly and effectively than simply relying on a third party like us. Uh, and of course, there are important roles for, for leadership in there as well. And, um, and to have people who are capable collaborators, uh, what we like to say, and, and what that looks like. 
So I'm going to take a sip of water right now while um, I dry out my well, <laughs> dried out my mouth talking so quickly there. And um, and maybe pause real quickly for a, a question or two, if there are any. Any questions, guys? Then I think um, we can take more questions at the end, and then we can proceed Surely. straight to the exercise yeah, first. No doubt. I'm speaking quickly because I don't want. <laughs> I'm I'm keenly aware of time, and I want to make sure I'm I'm managing our time. <laughs> I get, we want to make sure we can get through our activity. I've been burned too many times <laughs> running out of time. Uh, Hopefully the agenda helps. <laughs> so sometimes I just become this fire hydrant. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I will be able to come back and, and, and let everybody assimilate that as you're, as you're thinking about it. So what I, what I want to do now is, um, is introduce you all to what I was thinking. I mean, I know many of you have used probably a whole lot of different design thinking methods. I've, I've no doubt that, that many of you have lots of experience in there. And I was thinking, if is there a Luma method that maybe some of you don't have uh, as much familiarity with? The, and, and I thought maybe we, we would try one called What's on Your Radar. It's a wonderful participatory method. Um, if, if you look at the Luma system, you will find what's on your radar over here, right in the, um, so it's participatory research rather than field research, interviewing or, or observation, you know, um, it, it involves bringing something, somebody in and having them undertake an activity that helps us understand better what's important to those people uh, through participating in an actual activity. So this one, what's on your radar, is an exercise in which people plot items according to personal significance, as you can see. Um, and um, so I'm just gonna walk us through what that looks like real quick and, and, and how we're gonna do that. Um, there's going to be three parts to this. Um, this the, the first thing we're going to do is, is work individually. We'll probably do that in our breakout rooms, but that's mainly just so you know which which breakout board you are using. So the first part of this is we'll be we'll be capturing our interest individually. As a as a challenge statement, I thought the the, the practice scenario that might we might use is, is holiday travel planning. We're all in the middle of summer. Many of us are either thinking about uh, planning, a, carefully thinking about planning a, um, a, a bit of holiday travel, or maybe have already done that. Um, and so as social and travel restrictions ease around the world, um, I, I thought it'd be useful to find out what's top of mind for us as we think about holiday travel planning. So the way that we will do this first is that individually, um, we're gonna select a row below, right? We'll, we'll select our name. I'll, I'll select blue, just arbitrarily, randomly, will be my name. In the row we're chosen, we're gonna write down six to 10 things of importance to you as you think about traveling for holiday this summer. And I've got some, some, some general areas of things that we might think about, right? Um, in, in categories like those below. So, you know, things like getting there, right? How, how are we gonna to get to that destination? What about sites and activities? What, what, what's on our mind regarding lodging or the needs for family and kids or eating and drinking, right? Um, budget, expenses, getting around once we are there, how we're going to get around, and of course, climate and weather. So for me, I guess I would say I need to think about my wife's visa um, because uh, she's, uh, she's not yet an American citizen and traveling from the U.S. to, to Europe um, is a little bit challenging for her. So that's something that we really need to think very hard about. I would also say, let's say, um, I want a rental car. I mean, I love to have the freedom of having a rental car, um, but, you know, but but if I'm going to a country where I'm driving on the opposite side of the road, or uh, you know, how much is that gonna cost? Rental cars in America right now are outrageously expensive. Um, I, I'd love to have uh, some thinking about that. Um, I want an affordable, um, but comfortable, um, flight to, to get where I'm going. Uh, I don't want to spend 36 hours traveling there. Um, I'm a big foodie, so I want to make sure that I'm I'm really immersing myself in the local food culture wherever we go. Um, and I would say uh, um, I want to go um, I want to go somewhere where it's not too warm, right? 
Uh, I'm not sure where that's going to be yet, but that's that's going to be important. So these are just a few of the things that I'm that I'm thinking about, right? Um, and and I could add I could add more, but I'm trying to be as specific as possible. That's what each of us are going to do for about five minutes when when we start the clock here, right? If you've got more than than six or ten, by all means, you know, put those out there. Ten ten should be enough. After those five minutes. Cheska and I will send a, a prompt through to the breakout room to let you know it's now time to move over to your radar. And you can see down below, we've got um, we've got the, the boards that you'll be using. We may just use the first uh, four or five of those boards because we'll be working in groups of four, but you'll be able to find your breakout room. So what we'll do at that point, right, is in the bottom part is we're going to, um, we will, think it over your notes, we'll rank them by placing one of them in the very center, right? One will go here. Then we'll place another three notes out here in the second circle. And then all the remainder will be out in the final circle. So each of us is going to have one quadrant of that radar. Mine, for example, would be the blue one. So this would be mine. I'd have one note here in the center, if if we're looking at it like this, I'd have one note here in the in the center. I'd have three out here, right? That that are slightly less important, and then all the others would be you know out here. But that one in the center, I'm going to be very very careful to think about because that is the single most important thing to me, right? All the others are still important because we wrote them down, just slightly less important, right? So, and and then uh, and then once we've we, we've done that, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation and uh, discuss what those insights are as a group, right? So at, at that point, we can we can together discuss what patterns do we see uh, in in the center circle, and, and which one of those patterns might we share back to the whole group. Right? Maybe we've got four different things in the center. That's okay. Um, how, which one of those would we share back? Uh, what about the second circle? Um, again, do we see any patterns? We can we can jot those down here if we like, and and maybe mention one here or just drag it over for for what we'd like to share back to the whole group. And the same thing for the for the third one. We start to we we do this individually first, and then we get start to get a sense for what are the common themes or, or patterns that we might find from the group. So before I before I send everybody off to to do this on your own individually and in your groups, what clarifying questions do you have for what you're going to be doing? What clarifying questions are there? Any questions or everything? If if everything seems clear, maybe a quick thumbs up would be quite nice, guys. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Jessica, do you have breakout rooms? Ready yes, I have set it up. Okay, let me right. put everyone in and then we'll see you in a bit. We'll okay. see you in a bit and, and we'll send some instructions through uh, once yes. the time is up to move on to the next the next uh, section. Awesome. See you guys. If you see have any questions, feel free to drop it in chat.